the Nero, he drew a picture of me in the mirror. Came home and he posted on the refrigerator door. When I saw it, he touched me to the core. I was outdone. There's nothing more that a father wants to hear than admirations from his son. That night as I tucked him in, I wanted to be crystal clear, so I sincerely whispered in his ear, son, I love you. And yarding with his hands over his mouth, he said, daddy, I love you too. As he laid in front of me, I was touched. It was like a needle had stuck me in my arm and my blood was right in front of me, though I thought to myself. Yes. I wonder, does he really know for me what he has done? And does he know that I never could have been a father until he made me one? Right. And that until he was born, I never really knew me. And that I didn't know a thing about responsibility until he gave it to me. Right. And that until he was born, my future was kind of dim. But now that he's here, my life has been extended because even when I'm gone, I can live through him. Yeah. And although me and your moms don't get along. But then leaving you and your little brother in the house overnight was dead wrong. Yet he was strong enough to take the time out to take care of his little brother. It's just a shame that at 11 years old, he had to play the role as the man of his mom's house. Right. With all these distractions, he struggled to keep his eyes on the prize. While dealing with the everyday life of living in a low-income high-rise, not to mention dealing with his mother's addiction to drugs. But I swore in my life that he would never be a statistic or listed as a thug. So when he would come home with me on the weekend, I would help to build his self-esteem. I allowed him to dream and taught him just what it meant to be a strong black king. And kept him away from all hurt, harm, and danger. And told my son that you could be successful living in a low-income home if Jesus was born in a manger. Yeah. But there was like this deep-rooted anger that reflected in his attitude. Which caused some of his teachers to call me at home from school, but they ain't got a clue as to what he's going through now. And until he found a way to channel his anger, it just kept on slowing him down. Yes. But I'm proud to announce that he finally got it under control. Not only did he win first place in a school science project, but for the first time in his life, my little 11 year old made the honor roll. Yeah. So when I think about all the obstacles, the peer pressure from the other children, all the slanging and banging that he sees in front of his mother's building, the drug problems dealing with his mother, playing the role as the man of his mom's house and taking care of his little brother. When I think about how far he had come, and despite all the obstacles, everything that he has achieved and done, my son, they consider me to be his hero. But to me, my hero was my son. So when you hear me say my hero was my son, because finally, after fighting to get custody of him, he started having health problems. Shortly after, he was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, cancer. We fought it. We went through chemotherapy. We went through surgery. And on September 3rd, 2008, I lost my son to cancer. Mm -hmm. That's when my ministry was birthed. Amen. Yes. I told God, I said, if I can't save my son, give me the power 
to save as many young people as possible out here in this world. And so through my son, we have developed the Tyrone Hawthorne Cancer Scholarship Foundation. Right. We help young people go to college. He attended Urban Prep High School in the Inglewood community. And so we've been giving back since 2008, and I'm proud to say that we've helped so many young people with their books and their schools and their fees to go to college. I thank God for that. Amen. But that leads me to the elevator. <laughs> because God never told us that who was there in our life would be there with us forever. Right. The only constant thing, the only sure thing that we can count on is Almighty God. Amen. Job, as great as he was, well, yes. Satan began to bargain over the body of Job. He said, if you move your protection from him, he'll curse you to your face. He lost all of his children. Yeah. He lost his cattle. He lost his possessions. And sometimes in life, it seems like we're losing everything. But Job still wouldn't curse God. To and so you know, like Satan, an enemy that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's a thief. He came back to God a second time. He said, you know, all a man has, he'll give for his health, his life. The Lord said, you can do what you want to do, but you can't take his life. That goes to show you another thing, that the devil can't do anything without his boss's permission. And that's why Jesus told him after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he began to tempt Jesus, he said, is it not written that thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God? See, we give the devil too much credit, but he has limitations on him. He can't do what he wants to do without permission. And so Satan got to the closest person to Job. Remember, in the beginning, he said, if you move your protection, he'll curse you to your face. Well, it was the wife of Job. Satan came through her love. And she said, why don't you just curse God to his face and just die? I don't want to see you going through what you're going through. See, Satan will come to you through your love. He will come to you yes. through your hate. Yes. And Jesus is number one man, Peter. Come on. I think he had pumped him up and he said, Peter, no man could have told you that I was the son of God, but my father, my father revealed it unto you. Peter, on this rock, he wasn't talking about Peter when he said rock. He was talking about himself because he's the rock. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. Anything you bind in heaven is going to be bound in heaven. Anything you bind in earth is going to be bound in earth. And Peter began to get a little bit bigger. So when Jesus told him, he said, look, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to me. They're going to come and get me. They're going to torture me. They're going to kill me. I'm going to be dead for three days. And Peter said, wait a minute. You think I'm going to let this happen to you, Jesus? Now, anybody with knowledge know that he came into the world to die. How am I supposed to see my son again without the death of Jesus? How am I supposed to see my father again, my grandparents again, without the death of Jesus? So anybody that comes to try to prevent the death of Jesus, they must be saved. So Jesus looked at Peter and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me. And so don't be afraid to lose those who don't belong to you anyway to belong to God. He's just loaning them to us. And so when we go on this journey called the elevator, somebody say the elevator. The elevator. We're going to lose people at every floor. There's this elevator, right? It's full of people. Some family, some friends, some strangers, but you're all in the basement. See, the basement represents that brand new idea that was best to be manifested in your mind. But by the time you share your idea with the 10 people standing in the elevator next to you, some of them get off before the door even closes. Yeah. Sort of like those so-called friends. The ones who you thought would be there through thick and thin down to the end didn't even make it to the first floor. The door closes. The elevator rises. Much to your surprise, you're making progress. The bell rings, you're at the first floor. The door opens, and guess what happens next? Those childhood friends, well, they got goals of their own. Time for you to be strong because you're going to lose some of these friends during this ride. 
and fell alone. But as they walk out, a few more friends walk in. You started off with ten, but now you're down to eight. Now Dana, one of the new friends who just walked in, pressed floor two. So you know what that means. The next time the elevator door opens, they'll be gone too. But before they left, they introduced you to one of their friends who became your friend. Then y'all became close like kin. The door opens at floor two. You lose a few, but one man walks in. And he becomes your boyfriend. And now we're down to seven. Now only four out of the seven are the original occupants that you begin with. In all, there are two strangers. One cousin, your mom, one friend, one new friend, and a boyfriend. Now, Carolyn, the elevator passes floor three. Seems like life is finally looking up. Yes. But just as soon as you get comfortable, you're at the fourth floor and the door opens up. You're staring death right in the face. Quickly, you step back. He reaches in his arm and unexpectedly takes your mom. Everyone in the elevator consoles you. But this takes an emotional toll on you and your relationship. Everything you ever believed in or ever knew about is in doubt. You become so emotionally cold that right before the doors close, your boyfriend walks out. What's to expect by floor five? Now what just happened on the fourth floor was a game changer. But before floor five arrives, you will lose one of those strangers. But before he leaves, he whispers to you. There's something that I hope that you see. He said, what's that? That God wants you to go through everything that you're going through in order for you to get to where it is he wants you to be. He leaves. Floor remains. Only one more floor to go. But between the fifth and the sixth floor, you notice something. The other stranger reaches around you and hits the stop button. Everything is frozen except you and him. He said, okay, I think it's time for us to talk. Mm -hmm. I've been here since the beginning. And I've seen everything that happened. And not once did you ever acknowledge me. Oh I even gave you words of encouragement when you lost your mom. Oh I thought at that point you would want to get to know me. April, look around. Out of the ten that you started out with, there's only a few. Now you have a choice or two. You can continue on. Use the experience of what you've been through to help heal, or you can do what you've been thinking, go in that purse and take those pills. Yes, yes, yes. She said, no, I want to live. Mm -hmm. Well, then you need to learn how to forgive. Yeah, yeah. She now knew who she was talking to. She takes a deep breath. And ask for forgiveness. But he said, I'll forgive you when you learn how to forgive yourself. Yeah. He pressed the button. The bell rings. The door opens at the sixth floor. To your surprise, your ex-boyfriend is standing there. Offer you his hand. You turn right around, look at that man right in the face, and smile. See, out of the many people that have come into your life, you've already lost the majority. Expect for the ones closest to you to disappoint you, let you down, betray you, but don't you change, stay you. Right. And at the end of the day, when you place your family and friends before God, you will remove them to show you that he's a jealous God. Right. And none should be placed before him. Yeah. Trust him to know that he will replace everything stolen, restore everything lost, and heal everything broken. See, in life, you're going to have some knockdowns on the way up. But it's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's about how many times you get back up. That's that piece, y'all. Somebody say 69 years, 69 years. of blood, sweat, and tears. Blood, sweat, and tears. 69, years 69 years of blood, sweat, and tears. The year was 1955, 69 years ago, when this ministry started. Was it Pastor Matthew Anthony? Pastor Matthew Anthony. 1955. See, we live in 2024. We got a black woman running for president. We've already had a black man to be president. So our minds sometimes can't go back to what was happening in 1955. Amen. President Eisenhower was president. 
And there was a little black girl from Georgia mm -hmm. named Rosa Parks. Yes. In 1955, who refused to give up her seat on the bus. Well, that was a college student, HBCU, Martin Luther King Jr. See, they needed an outsider to come to speak to the insiders because sometimes when you grow up around somebody, they want to remind you of everything that you used to do when you was growing up with them. I'm, I'm talking to somebody up there because you've been through it before. They like to remind you. They don't even want to fathom the converted you. See, saved again is, uh, 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 born again is one thing. But the Bible says, be ye not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when we've had a transformation of our mind, we begin to think different. And when you begin to think different, some of the things that are inside of you starts to leave because no two things can occupy the same space at the same time. So if God is in you, some of that other stuff got to go. And because Jesus ain't here in the flesh no more, he said, I leave you another comforter. Yes. And so the word of God is here and the presence of him who was here. So the word which was made flesh is turned back to the word. And now we got access to him in the word. And when we began to read it and we began to eat the word, we began to put that king, which is the king of all kings, on our dome. And then we get the kingdom of God inside of us. 1955, Martin Luther King came in. He led the 300 and, and I believe 81 day bus boycott bankrupting the bus company, showing you what you can do, number one, with God on your side. But when we all come together, they want to separate us. They want to say, oh, you live in Robbins, or you live in Hazelcrest, or you live in Matson, or you live in Country Club Hills, or you live in Chicago. But we are all God's children. So don't let nobody come and divide, divide you by regional boundaries. I've never seen no soil nowhere on earth that reject the body that was placed into it. The earth is our home. And so I want to close out with this by saying congratulations for 69 years of ministry. And I'm going to close out with my testimony. Form. It's called Ego. Everybody say Ego. Ego. You know, some things as poets, we wish we never had to write. And this is one of those poems that I wish I never had to write, but I had to do it because this was my therapy. Like my mentee Geronimo came up here and said, y'all give him another nice round of applause. Yeah. We need more brothers that can speak to the youth. See, sometimes we take you back in a time machine to 2,000 years ago, but they know what's happening on the street today. So we need more street ministry going on. So I thank you, young man. Hey, God, where you at? I've been looking for you. Seems like you've been avoiding me or something. And I've been searching for you for years with no answer, just anticipation. And I've been going through this transformation. But every time I call on you, God, it's like I get put on hold. And they say that you hear all and, and that you see all. But seems like you ain't never available, God, when I call. See, all I remember it was January 91. I had just left Simeon's Martin Luther King ceremony speaking. I wasn't feeling too well that day, little did I know that all the while, my appendix had been leaking. And where were you, God? Just what I thought, nowhere to be found. And if it wasn't for my son's mother convincing me to go to St. Bernard's Hospital that night, Black Ice wouldn't be here with you and Robbins right now. And where were you at, God, that morning when I went to work and when I got to 123rd and Kedzie, right by the cemetery, this lady ran the light. Last thing I saw was headlights. A three-car collision that almost took my life. But where were you, God? And where were you at, God, when my mother was stricken with cervical cancer? She's been going to the Kingdom Hall, serving him since before I was born. And we both called on you, and, and you still didn't answer. Come on, God, this is my mother. 
Tell me, is this how you treat all your sons and your daughters? And where we went, God, that day my son died. I sat there at the University of Chicago and I watched them come back twice. You could have intervened. You could have saved his life. But, but where were you, God? And where were you at, God, when... Okay, my son, I've heard enough. Now I know that times for you have been rough, but son, where's your faith? Yes, look. Seems like you only seek my face when you need me. For I am a full-time God, my son. Do you really believe in me? Well, if so, then you would know that I am the creator of the universe. All that you see from the highest heights of heaven to what you have discovered beneath the earth. See, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of Moses, Lot, and David. I am the one who made Solomon wise. I put Noah in the ark before the waters could rise. I gave Samson the strength to destroy the Philistines with no eyes. I am that smooth stone that David slung that smoked Goliath in the head. The cracks that crumble the walls of Jericho. The same one that rose Lazarus from the dead. I am the blood of the lamb of the doorpost that kept the children of Israel safe from harm. Even the staff in Moses' is right arm. And he gave me the power to split the Red Sea in half. Shall I go on? I said, please forgive me, Father. He said, no, son. I already have. Amen. But like Jonah, you've been running from your mission. I've been trying to reach you and speak to you for years, but your ego just wouldn't let you listen. When your appendix was spreading poison through your body, I was the voice that spake to your son's mother warning you, and do you remember what you promised me, my son? Yes, Lord, I do. I promise you that if you allow me to make it through, then I will turn my life over to you. But what did you do? You continued to play. So I spoke to you again in the form of a three-car collision, but I allowed you to walk away that day. And have you ever asked yourself the question why the accident was by a grave site? I was showing you that the road that you were traveling on ended at the cemetery if you didn't change your life. But you still didn't listen. And as for your mother's cervical cancer, I am the reason why your mother's cancer is in remission. And I know your son's gone. But his body was sick, so I relieved him of his pain and I called him home. And yet and still I stayed by your side all those moments that you felt alone, yet you still rejected my truth. If you only could have put your ego to the side and listened to all those whom I sent to you. Lord, you mean to tell me what all the while I was... I was waiting to hear from you. You were sending me messages through all those whom I rejected. Yes, my son, this is true. And instead of focusing on the guides, submit to the truth that you find inside. But Satan is the one who subtracts and divides, but I am the one who adds and multiplies. I'm telling y'all, he opened my eyes. And so to those of you who can't accept the truth, because your ego will allow you to accept who the truth is coming through. Take this as a lesson. Because see, God says they use in these leaders today because asking some of these leaders questions is just like asking blind men for directions. But it's the truth that counts. And in this case, my ego. Just what my ego. But my ego was easing God.